the engine has a low compression ratio, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all set up in conjunction with that. Um, and it's, the power output of this engine is 1600 horsepower. Two-speed. Um, the two speeds are very close together. It's 8.1 and 9.5 times faster than the crank, so it's a lot faster. with a 10-inch in power in there, um, running at 30,000 RPM or something like that. <coughs> but the point about the two-speed system is, in theory, you could just leave the blower in high speed all the time because that's what we want for altitude. So why not just leave it in high gear? Because it won't overpressurize the engine. You throttle and the carburetor controls that. What actually happens is you end up with the throttle um, virtually closed all the time. You do anyway. I mean, sea level takeoff on this engine, the throttle is only about a quarter open. And what it means is the carburetor isn't that efficient, so they run the, the blower at a lower speed to 14,000 feet, and then it changes automatically to high gear. Or on the bow fire turn to it's manual control and cockpit, it's just a valve cable. Um, and the carburation is just an SU twin barrel carb. So anybody that knows about SU car carburetors with the needle and, and the jet yeah. yeah. barrel, it's exactly the same. It's got a huge needle and a massive hole in it. Like this, um, but it, it's, it's controlled, it's a twin choke, that's one difference. And it's controlled on one side by altitude. So as you climb, the air gets to <coughs> um, And you therefore want to weaken the mixture to, to correspond to that. On the other side of the carburetor, we've got boost control. Um, and similarly, let's put more air into the engine we want to watch in the mixture to keep it right. And they're quite accurate. I mean, they smoke a lot when they go between vacuum and boost, but then they settle down. Um, and there's very little else on it. It's, it's actually quite a simple unit. It's a float carburetor, as many of you all know. Um, completely useless in the Battle of Britain, really. I mean, they found ways around it. Um, and I can kind of understand why they used a the float car. Um, because the disadvantages are um, sort of outweighed in many respects by the, by the way that the carburetor works. And I mean, it produces, uh, well, they always, even when they went over to a fuel injection pump, which they didn't have the technology for now, right? they always injected the fuel before the supercharger, which is to get a latent heat of evaporation, um, which cools the mixture going into the engine. And, I mean, on a German. Yuma or Damon Benz and had a diesel type injection pump direct injection from cylinders, not into the manifold or anything. Um, and that loses, loses about 30% of your power basically. So it's, it's, when you're running on boost, it's a huge difference, which they do all the time. Um, so, in fact, the carburetor was fairly successful. And they, they, they got out of um, the fact that it can't fly negative G basically because if you turn the aircraft up, well, they didn't turn it upside down, so they wanted to suddenly dive like this to get away from somebody behind them. All the fuel goes to the top of the float tank when you, you know, jets are uncovered and the engine cuts out. Um, the next thing that happens, <coughs> that wasn't a problem because it'll cut back in again. The, the problem is that the, the fuel pump is a dual unit on this thing, so you've got um, it's a fail safe fuel pump. <coughs> two drive shafts. Um, and it's putting in so much fuel with the float cell open that it floods the engine. And any engine that's been flooded doesn't need to restart. Um, so you get all the black smoke, the engine stops again. Um, and it's very difficult to restart it. So um, Tilly Schilling worked with the RAE, came up with this Miss Schilling's orifice idea, which is a little <laughs> disc and orifice plate, which is got a maximum flow for it. And, what to do. Um, and that was a field modification, but in fact that was a very short lived thing. The modifications which are incorporated into this one are um, basically stops on the floats, um, a needle valve with a particular shape to it and a stop on the end of it so I can only open so far. And these are the sort of things which limit the fuel flow into the car filter. Um, and in addition, they keep the, um, the jet well in the bottom sealed so the fuel can't come out of it. It's a simple thing, isn't it? Um, they also experimented with spit pies with an IF running speed. Carburetors as well. Um, so, you know, in fairness to the Rolls Royce, they did get down the problem. Other features, just briefly about the engine, it's a dry sump like most aircraft. So, 
Sometimes, I mean, for example, a mosquito, um, particularly night fighters, when they're flying in very close to somebody, um, debris off somebody's shooting at them come back and hit it, um, blow the radiators out. They did have problems with it, but generally speaking, it, was, it wasn't as bad as you might imagine. In um, the, the unit on the side of the engine here is the uh, oil pressure relief valve, and you can sort of see pipes and feeding off everywhere from it. Um, it was only right at the end of the war. Um, and they put these things into airliners, really. And when they designed the Griffin, for a much later aircraft, they started putting everything in internal drilling. I mean, the pipes were on all these ones. Um, <coughs> and they have a low pressure feed to the back end of the engine. So everything you see on here is fed with about 4 psi. Well, that's fine. I mean, the supercharger is not going on it. It's got a ball race and a plane bearing on it. But they, it's one of the big downfalls of this engine, which everybody that works with knows about, is the camshaft. 4 psi oil feed comes in the top of the um, On a very cold day, it doesn't really affect us so much. Well, we run during the summer actually, we get a lot of cold days. <laughs> um, it can take minutes for the oil to run from there to the front end of the camshaft assembly. And if you have a look at the um, cylinder head that's sitting on the other side of the engine there, you'll get an idea of the complexity of it. Slows down the two rocker shafts and enough all the rocker arms. Um, and with very thick oil, it can take a long time. The camshaft runs on a chrome plated pad on the cam follower. Um, the chrome plating varied in quality, um, and really it just basically overheats. That's what happens over a period of time, and chunks come off it, and you find them in the fields at the bottom of the engine. Um, once that's happened, it just eats away the cam load. It's just bad design. I mean, there's one company in the States making roller followers for it now. Um, and in fact, the people that solved that were wrong for putting them in these tanks, I believe that tank um, The day came up with a roll of camp fellow at this point, as well. Rolls Royce never bothered with it, and, and oddly, they didn't put it on the Griffin in the Shackleton, which surprises me, because of course it's sold to one of those in 91. Um, and rubbish cans, really. It's one of the few criticisms of it. You know, the engine was very good, it was very strong. Um, and it had one big advantage over the Hercules and all of our other engines that it could fly outside its um, performance envelope, if you like. So if it was damaged or if you do a Lancaster with one engine, it could keep going. Have the engine running flat out for long periods of time. So it did have that in its favour. Um, and they were quite tough. Um, one of the oil feeds coming off the relief valve here goes along the side of the crankcase there, uh, goes into the filter down here, and it controls the propeller. Um, uh, the, as with most variable fixed propellers on aircraft, it, it runs on a, um, I think on a constant speed unit, which is a propeller governor. Um, and in here, this is a hydraulic mechanism um, with a piston, and it drives a slotted cam device, so it sort of does that, and it turns a bevel gear inside the hub, and it moves these blades. So this is my fine position setting here. Um, which is actually very coarse. I mean, the blades are stalled at that angle, that's nearly 45 degrees. Um, but for the point of running the engine and loading it, and not making too much wind, of course, behind it, that's <laughs> ideal. Um, as I load the engine up, the blades will go around there, and they'll be full of feather, so they're no cooling at all. But we get the maximum load you can get on it. Um, and whilst I can't set the angle of the blades with a lever on there, what I can do is tell it I want minimum RPM, which in the case of that. Constant speed garden is 1800 RPM. Um, so if we keep trying to hold the engine at 1800, we could eventually be fully pedaled anyway. Um, and then I can open the speed of the engine. And um, 
just as what's the temperature gauge, but other than that, um, the engine cools fine. And with the blades in this position here, it cools perfectly well. Um, the Merlins that were known for overheating, the ones that spit fires hurricanes, sort of have the radiator somewhere back here under the wind, and even further back there. And they just don't have the airflow <coughs> when they're on the ground. Um, anything like a Lancaster or this type of setup here was fine. They can run on the ground all day, no problem at all. Um, twin magnum transmission. Um, there's one on this side and one on the other. Again, it's standard on aircraft, light aircraft still use it nowadays. Um, I don't know if the Rotax engines do the small ones, I think some of them do have the engines to the spark plug. Um, it gives you about 100 RPM increase, so it gives you a lot more power. But of course it gives you a fail safe system, so if you lose one magneto, <coughs> each mag fires all 12 cylinders. You've got one plug on the exhaust side and one on the inlet side in here. The nightmare to get out. I mean the early Merlin has an ignition harness down the centre, which is nicely sculpted and then up and down like this all the way around the engine. Right down in here. Um, we've all had to come out to get the plugs out. This is a slight, a slight improvement here because it runs along the top of the engine. But they're quite a nightmare. You drop them in between the V frequently. Like <laughs> <laughs> you do, don't you? <coughs> <coughs> you drop the least one in there. Um, and uh, the cooling system, just to go back to that quickly, is a pressurised 30% um, glycol system that like you find in a modern car. They did start out early on with. Um, 100% ethylene glycol coolant, which I think is unpressurised, I seem to remember. Um, but it's flammable as well. Um, it doesn't give you as good a coolant as I think. Um, and this is a 30 psi system, so it's a reasonably high pressure coolant system. Um, and the, the unit on the side there is an eye tool, so most of what you see in the front there is a radiator. Well, it's in the it's and that's fine with the right over the pool. Um, and it's a, a copper matrix. But later on, on things like the Shackleton aircraft, they had an aluminium radiator that's really light. Well, they're two of them. But they're quite small. I don't think there's much chance I can walk on about it. Anyway. <laughs> um, I'm, sure you're all getting, I'm sure you're all getting hungry. Um, but uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy seeing it run later on. Anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, as much as I enjoy running, it's quite fun. Thank you very much.